the Bible in the 21st century, we're looking at various themes that are taught in the Bible. This is the first of a series of presentations where we're going to be looking at end times. What guidance can we find, particularly in the New Testament and the teaching of Jesus, with regard to end times? This is the first presentation and I'm going to offer an overview of the theme here and then an outline of where we're going in the following presentations. End times means that we're looking at things like the final judgment that all humans face, the return of Jesus, to wrap up history. The idea of a new heaven and a new earth, what's meant by that? And a resurrected life, which is taught so clearly in the New Testament. All these come under the broad heading of that fancy word, eschatology, which is just a fancy word which means all the topics, themes and ideas that relate to end times. Specifically, there are questions like that. At the end of time, what happens to this world? What happens to all the evil in the world? And the source of the evil, that's Satan, the evil angel. But perhaps for ourselves, the biggest question is, what happens for ourselves? What does the Bible teach about end times? Now there are some things that are broadly agreed and somewhere there's a fair measure of disagreement. In this series we'll touch upon these. So among the followers of Jesus we might say that there's broad agreement in things like the simple fact that the world will end. It'll all be wrapped up eventually. But there's a common teaching that suggests that there are signs of the return of Jesus. Signs of the times is the phrase that's used. I'm going to show that that's very misleading. There's broad agreement on the fact that Jesus will return. He said it about himself. But there's lots of disagreement about what we mean by rapture. And when we look at that, we will see that there are an awful lot of somewhat naive ideas that are flying around. And we've got to disentangle what the Bible actually teaches from a lot of the make-believe that's come out of all kinds of books. There's broad agreement that when Jesus does return, all humanity will see him. But there's a lot of disagreement about the timing of his return and the relationship that with, of that with what's known as the millennium, a thousand years. And we're going to have to look at that and I'll show it in some ways we're asking the wrong question, a question that the Bible doesn't answer. There's broad agreement that there will be judgment. If there was no judgment, God not putting things right then it is totally unfair for so many people have suffered so badly in this life. Somehow there's got to be a writing of things, justice. But the basis of that judgment, that's not always agreed. Let's look at what the Bible says. There's broad agreement that resurrection, by that we mean we have a new life in new bodies following death. That's the meaning of the word in the original. But there's quite a lot of disagreement about what we mean by heaven and hell. And when we pull that apart we have to recognize that a lot of the teaching stems from false ideas that floated around in the days of medieval Christianity. And they're not really very biblically based. 
There's broad agreement that Satan, the evil angel that orchestrates the evil in the world, and all his assistant angels who carry out his bidding, they'll be finished forever. Evil will be banished forever. But just what is the nature of the judgment for humans? What does that involve? There's broad agreement that there'll be something, a new heaven and a new earth. Maybe we're not quite sure what it will mean. But there's disagreement about the long-term future for this planet. We need to pull that out and look at what the Bible actually teaches. Now there's some of the kind of themes where there's some areas of great agreement and some areas where there's disagreement or uncertainty. We'll try to get a picture that's clear and where we can't be sure, we need to show why we can't be sure. The problem is when we come to this kind of topic, that when we find somebody who holds different views from us, we kind of lock horns, determined that our view will win the day, just pushing and waiting for the other person to back down. Sometimes we just shout things at each other as if we're absolutely certain. We've got the authority to be certain. We're not actually listening to what other people are saying. And as I go through this series, there'll be things where you've got to listen to what I am saying and not read into it what you think I am saying. We have to listen to each other with respect. Here's a simple illustration. Two people dogmatically saying three bars, four bars. Interesting piece of drawing. But it illustrates the point. It's too dangerous to insist that we are right. Which of these two is right? Mahatma Gandhi said that. You see, when we discuss things openly with respect, we can learn from each other. It leads to progress. We're not trying to win or force our view on other people. And Paul said that. As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. That's the problem. We've got different perspectives, different experiences. And that well-known quotation, we don't see things as they are, we see things as we are. We come to these ideas in some ways with our minds made up. We've read a book, we've heard a sermon, someone's taught us, we think we're certain how to interpret the Bible. <clears throat> and we're pushing aside other people who challenge that interpretation. We don't see things from the same perspective. Now I'm going to focus in this series particularly from the perspective of the biblical writers. Not my opinion, not my view. What did they actually say? What did it mean? In one presentation we'll look at any insights we can gain from the sciences. But the bulk of this will be looking at things from the biblical writer's perspective. In all of this we're trying to sort out the facts from the dross. We've got to admit that in this area of end times there's all kinds of misunderstandings and misrepresenting of one person misrepresenting another. And there are bits of half-truths that fly around. There are so many books that may make interesting novels, but we can't rely on them as our source of evidence. There are confusions and doubts, and let's be honest, there are areas where we're not sure. But there's also myths and make-believe. 
people have decided what it is, they've made up their mind, they bend the Bible to fit. Let's look at the evidence, as objectively as I'm capable of doing. The evidence mainly from the Bible. And let's bring the evidence together to see if we can make sense of all of this. That's a great insight that someone gave. Let's come with humility, that's strong. Let's not come with dogmatism. That's weak. It's worth pondering that. When people are dogmatic, it often reveals that their arguments are somewhat flimsy. Now let's come to the Bible recognizing that the Bible is the story of the way God interacts with human beings. The story is told through the life of a family. A family where at the beginning Abraham was prepared to listen to God. He made lots of mistakes. Nonetheless, he was prepared to listen to God and follow his instructions. That's where it started and his descendants. It then moved into a people group that were descended from him. They made lots of mistakes. But it's the story of the way God interacts with human beings. The center part of the story is Jesus. God interacts with humanity in the life of Jesus. God entered our human condition in the life of a human being. He was not contaminated by the mess of the world, but he brought hope, light, encouragement, positiveness to all around. And he solved and addressed and solved the problem that is the major problem of humanity, our rebellion against God. And in his life, death and resurrection, he offers us freedom. The, that's the purpose of the Bible. It's a story. So let's go back and see what the Bible actually says because we're looking at the story when it's coming near the end. What does it say? So we've got to ask simple questions when looking at a passage from the Bible. We've got to ask, when was it spoken? Most of them were spoken and written down later. Where? And to whom? Now, all things that are spoken or written were done for a reason. Why was it spoken? And then we've got to ask the fundamental question, what would the original hearers and readers have got from it? How would it have been understood? And we're so fortunate today that there are literally tens of thousands of quality books that can guide us and take us through that written by scholars who really understand there is no language, really understand the culture of biblical days, and have made it accessible to us. When we do that, then we can ask the question. If we come to a Bible passage and we decide in advance about what's true, we're in danger of getting the thing wrong. When we come to a Bible passage and just rip a verse out of context, ignoring the context of when, where and to whom it was spoken, we're likely to end up with confusion. So let's be very cautious and look at the text in the context when it was originally spoken. The Bible was not written in English, or indeed in any modern language. Most of the Bible was written in Hebrew in the Old Testament, Greek in the New. The small parts in the language of Aramaic. It's not there is no language, so it's been translated. And when you translate anything, you've got to remember that 
there aren't necessarily exact equivalences of words. So we've got to look back and say, how would it have been understood? Biblical culture is very different. They didn't think the same way. Two or three thousand years ago, cultures have moved. God doesn't change. Human beings fundamentally don't change. Therefore, the basis of the interaction between God and humanity, that doesn't change. But cultures do change. And we've got to take that into account. And we've got to be careful and cautious. This is going to try and be fairly comprehensive. Too dangerous just to pick up a passage and build everything from one. We may have that passage right, but we're not seeing other passages which throw light and give us other dimensions of thought and insight. But that's the biggest danger. We've read books. We've heard things taught in churches or other Christian groups. We've worked things out for ourselves. We've decided what it's going to be. And then we come to the Bible and we kind of try to make the Bible text fit with what we've already decided. Now that's not easy to resist. That's hard going. Come with me. I'm going to try and go to the biblical text fresh. What does it actually say? What would it have meant? Therefore, what's its significance for us today? Let's just open the doors of our minds. There are things that you will find uncomfortable. Things that will not fit what you've been taught. Look at the evidence I present. Weigh it. Ponder it through. If you're in a group, discuss it. Open your minds to new possibilities. I'm going to start with some words. Hold on to your seats. I don't normally do this. But I think it will help us see some very, very important ideas. When you've got the idea of coming, which could be a verb to come or coming a noun. When you've got the idea of coming, there's more than one word in the original language. We're going to look at the New Testament. That's the common word. That's the rare one. And they've got a rather different meaning. Archimai, the top one, to come. It's very, very common. The lower one speaks of coming or arrival. And there is a verb from it. But I'm going to pick the noun here. That's the word that the biblical writers always use when they're referring to the return of Jesus. His coming, his arrival. We'll see in a moment why. So unless that word's there, we've got to be cautious. It probably does not refer to the return of Jesus. Then we've got the word end. Oh, it's so simple. Three letters. That's the common one. That's the rarer one. But the lower one, Centelia. Some people pronounce it Centelia. That one speaks of the total and complete end where tellers can normally refer to just the end of something. Something else follows it. That's the word that the biblical authors always use when they talk about the end of time when Jesus comes. We've got a difficult word here, age. They didn't think in the biblical days of time the way we do. That's a very common word and greatly misunderstood. And we've got a phrase here. It conveyed a little bit, day of the Lord. And that word has got an elastic meaning. It can cover many things. Now we're going to pull these apart just a little bit more because these words help us to understand the Bible, the New Testament, about the return of Jesus. 
Now that word parousia is the presence or arrival of someone important. It could be used of anyone, but it was the word that was used for the arrival of the emperor, the Roman emperor, to be greeted by and to meet his people. So you can see why that word is used when it's referring to the return of Jesus. He is infinitely important. And when he returns his arrival, he's coming to be greeted by and to meet his followers. That's the word that's always used. They didn't have clocks, they didn't have stopwatches, they didn't have calendars. Everything was just seen from within the lifespan of the person. And other people were related from one to the other. They didn't use the word eternity or eternal in a time sense. It's not the opposite of time, temporality. In other words, eternal life is not life going on forever. That's not what the word means. They thought in the, in the idea of a series of ages. Something we don't think about today. And so there's the age of the kingdom of God. And then there's the age after the kingdom when Jesus returns. So they speak about this age and the age to come. Now they're not thinking in terms of time as we would. They're thinking in terms of life quality. And that's captured by the phrase eternal life. Eternal is a word not of quantity but of quality in the original language. It just means of the age. If you like life that belongs to the quality of God. Now that word centelia is the word that carries something to do with the complete end, consummation, completion, fulfillment, end completely, bringing to an end. It's total, it's complete. And you can see why they use that word to refer to the return of Jesus. He's going to bring the thing to an end completely. Now we tend to come to the text through a Western mindset. It's a Middle Eastern mindset, the New Testament of about 2,000 years ago. In that culture, let's be cautious. The different ways of thinking, different culture. Now I spoke about the Day of the Lord, a phrase with an elastic meaning. Too often, too dangerously. As soon as you see the phrase, Day of the Lord, people think it's end times. That's not a correct deduction. The idea of the biblical authors was they had complete confidence that God would intervene in human affairs to put things right. Judgment, justice, carries the idea of God coming to put things right in the biblical usage of the words. So God's going to come and put things right. There are consequences for wrong and evil. And in general, it speaks about this in this life. Completely in the Old Testament, in the New, it goes into the life when Jesus returns. And when God comes to put things right, God's people are going to enjoy blessing in some way. So we've got to watch when you meet the phrase, Day of the Lord. It is not necessarily end times, and I'm being generous here. It usually is not end times. Because the day of the Lord was the day when God would intervene in human affairs to put things right. And it's used all over the Old Testament in places in the New, and it can refer to this life, not end times. It's a principle, not a specific thing. And when the word imminent, the idea comes up, it just means it's impending. It's going to happen. doesn't have the time idea that we tend to have in our language today. The Old Testament looks forward to God intervening in human affairs to put things right. You can see that vividly in the prophecy of Isaiah. What a mess the nation had made of it. God was going to intervene in sending the servant king to put things right. 
the New Testament, the ultimate putting things right is related to the return of Jesus. But God can intervene in the affairs of human beings here and now to put things right when we really go too far. So the ultimate putting things right related to end times, human self-sufficiency and oppression, that just comes to an end. Violence and evil brought to an end, justice upheld. But God will intervene in the human affairs throughout time, throughout history. You can see it again and again. And that links to the way the phrase is used in the Bible. It's got it accurately picturing what the reality shows is true. When human beings go too far, God will intervene. But at the end of time, God will intervene finally at the ultimate end to put things right. Now with these words in mind, this is a picture of what we're going to do looking at the key biblical sections here. Matthew 24 and 25 the disciples ask two questions. They're confused. Tragically, our interpretation of the answers of Jesus are often confused. Now we're going to disentangle that, which is quite easy. We just look at the words Jesus used. We look at what Paul said about it. In his Thessalonian letters, he addresses some confusions, and they're just some confusions. It's not totally logical or comprehensive. There are some confusions that these new young followers of Jesus in Thessalonica were facing. <clears throat> They'd got themselves in a mental mess. He tries to straighten it out. When he writes to the followers of Jesus in the large city of Corinth, that's the great stretch that gives the teaching on a resurrection, what it means. John said a lot. <coughs> in his first letter, he speaks about the Antichrist concept. Now that's gone into the folklore. And the way it's gone into the folklore is completely detached from the biblical meaning. He speaks about the two beasts in chapters 11 to 14 of Revelation. We're going to have a look at that and what they mean. And then in chapters 19 and 20, people have deduced the concept of the millennium. We'll look at that and show that's not quite as straightforward and black and white as it might appear. Peter said a little in his second letter and he speaks about the home of righteousness. Interesting and wonderful picture. We're going to ask the question, looking at it from the Bible and from history, where does Israel fit into all of this? And I have to say this is a tragic story of complete confusion misunderstanding, misinterpretation of biblical text and giving them meanings that people have predetermined in advance and imposed them on the biblical text. <clears throat> Let's just look at what the Bible actually says and uh, does not say and deduce something about the place of Israel. The problem with that, which leads into the next two presentations, is that the return of Jesus often confused with the fall of Jerusalem. Jesus predicted the fall of Jerusalem. It took place about 40 years later. It was absolutely horrendous and brutal. So horrendous and brutal that it was easy to think this is the end of the world. Not so, says Jesus, don't get confused. And he sorts it out when we look at the language he uses. And once we get what Jesus is saying, it's so straightforward. Now the next two presentations are going to look at that based on the Matthew's account. Now there are accounts in Luke and Mark, but Luke only really addresses the fall of Jerusalem, not end times. Mark covers both, but it's a bit briefer. So we're going to use it from Matthew just for simplicity because it's the longest and it covers both. I'm not going to show how it's very easy to sort these things out and to understand what Jesus taught 
but we're going to start by looking at what he did not teach, which is where the confusions have arisen. So here's a kind of map of our journey in this series. This presentation has merely offered an overview, broad brush picture of the issues, where we're going. We're going to look at what Jesus did not teach in Matthew's Gospel. Then we're going to look at what Jesus did teach, both of them drawn from Matthew 24 and 25. Then we'll look at Paul's teaching when sent to the Thessalonians, which is merely answering questions that they'd thrown at him. His systematic teaching on a resurrection in 1 Corinthians. We'll look at John's teaching in his letter and what we can glean from the insights of Revelation 19. And then we'll follow that by looking at the last two, two or three chapters. Coming away from the Bible temporarily, I want to draw in some recent research from the sciences. My own area. And we can see how this does offer a picture that's remarkably consistent. Then we'll look at the place of Israel in end times. And that's got major implications for today. Then finally, I shall try a attempt to bring it all together into a kind of logical and cohesive whole. So it's quite a long series but it's in a sequence. You need to take it little bit by little bit, ideally in a group, where after you've watched a presentation, you can then discuss and refer to the presentation. So they begin to begin together to understand what the Bible teaches, what is the evidence, and we've got a better understanding of this. When we understand the goal of where this planet is going and where we're going, it's got direct relevance for life here and now. We're not just doing this to fill our heads with knowledge, but we're thinking about the implications for us today in ordinary living. So the next presentation we're going to move on and looking at what Jesus did not say before we then move to what he did teach.